All right. Uh, welcome to CFD 8215. Um, as most of you are aware, I have posted a recording of the course introduction to try to save a little bit of time going forward. Uh, because, of course, your first lecture was on IEC day one, which all classes were cancelled, which means we are short two hours before the first half of the term. I will give you guys a tiny little bit of extra information right now. Um, lab rules and of engagement will be covered for the ones that haven't had me yet in about two hours. However, um, please ignore the screen behind me right now because it has nothing to do with what I'm saying. The course is split into two halves. First half is theory heavy, second half is more practical. It is designed in such a way that it's like too many courses jammed together. Um, for those that are already had questions about when is the midterm? What's on the midterm? Holy cow, we haven't had our first class yet. That having been said, the midterm is the last week before the break in this room at this time. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's going to be on paper. Congratulations, you get to be inflicted with Scantron. What is covered in the first half is tested, then what is covered in the second half is tested, but it is not a cumulative test at the end. At least it wasn't last term, and I'm hoping it's not this term. If it suddenly changes, I will tell you guys as soon as I know. That being said, I'm going to dive into week one lecture, which should have happened last week. And we will, um, for lack of a better word, Go through this briskly. Um, there are several slides in this slide deck that are pointless. At least not pointless in the sense of you shouldn't know about them, but they're not required for me to go over four slides over one topic. Um, the slide decks are going to be as is in Brightspace for your perusal. Um, the version I have in front of me is pretty much identical to what's up there now. Um, I, you, I will tell you guys when I'm going to start skipping slides. Don't panic because I'm skipping slides. It's because there's four slides that covers the exact same topic ad nauseum. I'm not a fan of ad nauseum coverage. Um, something else you will discover I'm, might not be like some of your other profs. You may get picked on as a group. Don't panic, that's just me. It's not you. I try not to, but life is what it is. And, you know, 47 years of life is really hard to get over. Okay, so starting today, lecture one was about the background of a database, which is why I'm going to go through it briskly because it's covered in the test, but not in great amounts. So, we're going to talk about what databases are currently. Uh, we're going to understand the nature and the characteristics of some database systems. Uh, we're going to define a very specific term, uh, DBMS. We're going to define the term database and what actually is a database. Uh, we're going to talk about an enterprise class database system and explain the functions they perform. And we're going to talk about things like metadata. Essentially, Whenever you're interacting with anything on the internet, you're probably talking to a database. Very few systems are not connected to a database. Heck, if you've got a cell phone, which um, nowadays is a stupid question to ask, if you, it's more like who does not have a cell phone, there's actually probably several pieces of database software running in it. Android's got a couple running built in, and I'm sure Apple does too. So what is a database? A database is an organized collection of logically related data. Um, that's actually a pretty dense sentence. Essentially, um, what that means is we collect information that are that is related to itself and try to organize it. And this information, once it's organized, becomes data. Unorganized data is basically raw information. 
a database is referred to as a self-describing collection of integrated tables. Uh, again, that's a dense sentence. In other words, a database is self-describing. In other words, you define a structure, the data goes into it, the structure describes itself. Um, the tables are called integrated because they store data about the relationships between the rows of data. So you've got a bunch of data in the database in different bins. And you can usually I use a filing cabinet as my example. Um, and normally I ask how many people here have worked or have been an accountant at least once in their life. And normally, you know, I say how many people have worked with an accountant and I usually get one or two in a group. And if I get none of this group, it's going to be a really sad example. Yeah, it's a sad example today. Okay, one, two, good. Three, there. Thank you for not making me feel lonely. Um, accountants love their paper. They like organizing things. They're anal retentive about organization. And they love their filing cabinets. And a business is run on information that is organized into data. So when you think about it, a database is like a filing cabinet. The different tables are like the different folders in the drawers. And the data itself is the pieces of paper in each of the folders. That is the visual, the closest visual I can give you to what's actually happening inside a database. The database is also called self-describing because it stores a description of itself. Inside the database, there's some magic tables that you can't see, and they store something called metadata. The metadata describes the structure of the database. The metadata controls how the database will communicate with the world. Basically put, it's data about data. And skip that because that one repeats everything that was on the previous slide. This slide repeats what's on this slide. Databases are all around us, literally they're everywhere. Pretty much everything you use on your day-to-day -day life involves a database. Here at the school, for example, you have Access, Brightspace. Uh, there's one you guys don't see called Genesis, which is basically what populates Access, and Access populates Brightspace. Now, it's a bunch of data systems that overlap on each other. There is, um, those are just the ones that affect you here at the school. Outside of that, there's, you know, if you're talking about Ontario, there's the databases that keep track of your driver's licenses, your OHIP cards, your medical records. Those are all examples of databases that affect you on a regular basis. Um, so the next three or four slides are some I'm going to go over really quick because they're basically talking about the same thing over and over and over again. And then another example of a database that you query, TV streaming, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, tons of databases in the background. Um, Netflix is basically 100% running on Amazon, just so you know. Uh, so every time, you know, Amazon East goes south, a bunch of Netflix disappears for a while, then Amazon East comes back and Amazon's, uh, Netflix is back. Uh, personal cloud storage. That would be your Google Drive, your OneDrive, uh, Dropbox. Insert preferred way to back up your files. And you are backing up your files, correct? Odds are you should be using one of these. This is when I do a little aside for don't trust your laptop. Shit happens, especially to students. Your laptop is being hauled all, hauled all over the place. School gives you a OneDrive, take advantage of it while you're here. Get like a terabyte of storage. Sports, whatever, sports leagues. Sports have ton of stats, it's all in a database. Esports have tons of stats, unfortunately. It's also all in a database. Uh, finances, I think that goes without saying, your bank is a big giant database. There's very little money in a bank nowadays. A couple little machines at the front where they punch some numbers and it spits out a pile of cash. They reload the cassettes every day. The workers don't even get to unlock the cassettes. They literally just get shoved into the machine. And another cassette gets pulled out and given to the, to the you know, secured truck. 
everything else, the money is fake. It's all ones and zeros in somebody's database somewhere. It sounds really dystopian, but, you know, literally is what it is. That's why we can, you know, pull out our phone, tap to pay. Because it's all in a database. Uh, government organizations already covered those. Um, you know, all your records with each level of government. Uh, eight, you know, um, Revenue Canada knows an awful lot about you. The government of Ontario knows a fair amount about you. Your local government doesn't know so much about you, unless you own a house. Then they know way too much about how much water you use. Social media, again. Got, you got your Twitter, unfortunately. You got your Instagram, which is even worse. WhatsApp, which is just Facebook with a different name. And good old TikTok. They're all running behind the scenes databases. Uh, E-commerce. I just need to use one word to describe this. Amazon. Kohl's, or sorry, Indigo. It used to be called Kohl's. I've just dated myself a little. You buy stuff online, it's going into a database. This database is updated when it gets sent to you. There's all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, healthcare, already covered that one. Weather, sure. It goes into a database. Thanks to these tons of information they're collecting in databases, they can run some uh, predictive analysis on it and maybe get the weather right. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Okay. So, some characteristics of a relational database. The purpose of a database is to help people track things that interest them. Whether it's interesting for me or interesting for you, that might be different pieces of information you care about. Some people might care about their standings in the law leagues. I couldn't give a rat's ass. Great. You each have your things that we like to keep data about. Databases can be sorted into two categories, relational and non-relational. And those will be defined in a moment. And large data sets are referred to as big data. Whenever you hear the word big data, it just means they have piles and piles of data shoved into databases somewhere. It's like the phrase cloud. Oh, my stuff's on the cloud. So it's just on somebody else's computer in somebody else's house or somebody else's building. Big, big data is just a big pile of data shoved somewhere into somebody's database server in some way, shape, or form, whatever form that may take. There are tons of different database services, and there's tons of different ways of storing data. So a relational database is a database that enforces relationships between things. Sort of like how the school enforces a relationship between um, a teacher or a prof and students, students to classes, that relationship is enforced. Um, technically, you're not allowed to take somebody else's classes unless you're registered there. Most of us will never even notice if you come or go because from one day to the next, we see so many faces that it takes us a while to get everybody under control. Uh, Non-relational is <clears throat> an older way of doing things, which seems to be which resurged for a while and then kind of found its place and it's doing its thing. Uh, those are things as NoSQL databases like MongoDB, et cetera, et cetera. But this course is about relational database systems. So non-relational stuff will be mentioned, but it will not be a big focus. So in a relational database, data is stored in something called tables. Tables have rows, also known as records, and columns, which are also known as fields. It looks like a spreadsheet. Now, usually at this point, I say, how many of you have used a spreadsheet? Normally, I get more than three or four hands. You don't need to be shy. You're not going to be judged for having used or not used a spreadsheet. So a spreadsheet is a grid. Columns and rows. A table is basically a series of columns that are defined to have the columns have names and stuff like that. And each of those columns contain a specific kind of information and a collection of those columns is known as a row. So 
all of the columns put together is equal to row. Then you do another one, put a file on all the columns, you have another row. We will actually go into significant more detail later in the term on this stuff. Don't panic that it's coming by fast. Nothing to worry about yet. So a database may have multiple tables. Each table stores data about different things. So for example, here at the school, this even applies to when you were in high school. So it's not like that big of a stretch. Those of us that are older, you know, it gets a little rougher, but the school in Axis, we have, so we've got two there, one there, one there, and that's it, guys. You're welcome. Oh, and I got one there too. Now, in Axis, there are many tables. There's a list of students. Um, there might actually be contact information for each of the students in a separate table if you have multiple addresses. You have uh, instructors, you have programs, you've got courses, you've got sections. These are all different pieces of information. And once you shove them all together, we have a way of being able to tell you, uh, this student has this class at this time with this prof. That is what, you know, multiple tables in a database looks like. Uh, throw in a table stores data about an occurrence or an instance of the thing of interest. The term instance will be defined better later. Um, but essentially each row in the system, for example, in the students table, each of you is a row. There's your student number, your name, your address, probably a phone number, an email address, amongst other pieces of information, you know, your date of birth, possibly your SIN number or your uh, passport number or your student visa number. Pick your, pick your information that might be shoved in there. There is an awful lot of information in the student's table about you. So when you think about the in student's table, each student in this room is an instance of a row. So everything that describes you is a row of data. Everything that describes him is a row of data. Everything that describes him is a row of data. And database stores the data because it's now organized. It's no longer just information and it's relationships between them. A sample of a relationship, which, you know, there will be more definitions coming, but a definition of a relationship is a connection between say, a student and a prof. So I have hundred some students assigned to me in this class. Each of you have one prof assigned to you for this lecture. And how are we connected? In the system via section 300. So there's a relationship, you to a section, me to a section. Thanks to that connection to the section, we are now related as far as the database system is concerned. Okay, so databases create information. Um, I'm not a fan of the title of this slide. I didn't create these slides because we're all using a standardized, standardized set of slides for this course across all six sections of you. There's a lot of you in level one this year. Like it's, I think it's our second biggest level one we've ever had. Um, it's the biggest level one for 8215. Um, because databases create information. It's more like databases create data from information. So data is recorded facts and figures that is organized and stored. Um, and information, it's, it's odd because depending on which textbook you use and who taught in the past, the words data and information start flip-flopping. Um, so realistically, knowledge derived from data, some people will call that information. I call it knowledge, just so you know. Um, anything that is presented in a meaningful context can be useful information for a person. It's, but before it hits a database, it's disorganized information, like it's just 
you know, data points. Um, and then, you know, if you summarize, order, average, compute, any kind of like that, that's also considered, you know, uh, knowledge. Uh, databases record data. So it does in such a way that we produce output from the data. You know, they, the textbook we're all being inflicted with likes to use the word information interchangeably before and after it comes into the database. So it's information before it goes into the database and becomes data. And then when you pull it out of the database, it's information again. It, that's not quite right. Um, essentially, information is in the wild. It gets put into a database, it becomes data. And then what comes out of it is knowledge. It's just like some people like interchanging the word information and knowledge. They're not the same thing. Knowledge is a collection of facts based on collections of data that come from wild information out in the field. There's a reason why it's called uh, knowledge systems or, infra and, or, you know, business information systems. You'll notice you almost never see the word information without a qualifier after it's been in a database. So when databases operate on their data, it can produce information about each student. It can produce what courses you have, what your GPAs are, uh, things like that. All right, so a database system has four components. So we're done talking about data. That was way too much talking about data for when the, we're at the point you don't even know what data looks like. So we're going to talk about the database system. A database system consists of four components. Users. These are the people that access the database. The database application. That's the front end the users are touching. So an example of a database application that you guys are touching every single day, Brightspace is a database application. Um, Access is a database application. It's a really slow, brutal database application, um, but it's there. You log into your banking app, you know, go and launch the good old BMO app. Check how little money you have left today. And you will, you're accessing a database application because it talks to a database. There is the database management system. So that's the software that runs behind the scenes, maintaining the database. A DBMS is things like MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server. They're basically pieces of software running out there or on your machine as applicable. That is basically allows you to maintain the database. It allows you to communicate to the database, allows you to talk back and forth with the database. And then there's the actual database. The database, as I finished talking ad nauseum, is basically a structure that contains data that lets you not generate knowledge. Now, most modern database servers, especially of the relational flavor, which is, as I said earlier, what we're going to be focusing on in this class, uses something called structured query language, also known as SQL. SQL is an internationally recognized language that is used by all relational database servers. They have slightly different implementation, different levels of implementation, but they all offer a baseline set of features that works pretty much everywhere. And this is one of those moments where I take an aside just for a second and refer to SQL. You will never see, hear me say SQL ever. It's one of my pet peeves. SQL is an initialism. It's like IBM. SQL was created by IBM. You don't say IBM 
or IBM, it's IBM, so it's SQL. It used to be called SQL when they first tried to roll it out. Then the IBM got sued by somebody else who had a computer program called SQL. And that died a very fast death. So it's SQL. But the problem is a lot of people still use the word SQL because they're lazy and they don't want to say SQL is less hard to say than SQL. Whatever. Uh, DBMS. It's a program used to create, process, and administer a database. I just finished defining it. And I described the database allocation. Basically, it's a piece of software that allows a user to talk to the database. And, you know, here's a picture that just describes what I just talked about for the last five minutes. We've got a user that uses a database application that talks to the DBMS, which talks to the database. The communications are bidirectional for every one of those steps. Because the user types something in, then the user reads the results on the screen. The application sends something to the DBMS. The DBMS will respond with something back to the application, which it reads. Database, the DBMS, same deal. The management system will tell the database to do something. The database will feed information back to the database server. Each of these layers is abstracted and it reduces the amount of um, information coming back to the user so that usually the time it hits the user, the information is significantly simplified and easier to understand. The purpose of every layer between the user and the database is to make it human understandable. And here's the exact same slide, but with FSQL shoved in the middle. Whatever. Next. So I just finished talking about this. Okay. So examples outside of the student stuff that I've been talking about. Um, anybody here ever work in sales? Okay, now we got more hands. There we go. So if you've worked in sales, you've probably dealt with a customer relation management system. That's a spot where organizations will shove stuff like leads. Those are potential sales. Customers, the stuff they've bought. It allows companies to, you know, try to get more money out of you. That's the customer relation management system. That's what its purpose in life is. Enterprise resource planning, ERP. It's an accounting system on steroids. Anybody here ever study accounting in high school or in grade school? Good, there we go. Might not have worked with accountants, but you've studied accounting. Good enough. A general ledger, accounts payable, accounts receivable. Those are words that people that have taken accounting will not be, will not find mysterious. The general ledger is the final repository of everything financial. Accounts receivable is when people owe you money. Accounts payable is when you owe people money. An ERP system amalgamates it all as a single system. When I went through school in the 90s, back then, computer programming was often under the umbrella of the School of Business, not a school of technology. We, I learned way too much about business processes. And strangely enough, it's been 26, 27 years now, heading on 27 years, and very little has changed on how it's all done. New rules, but that's about it. E-commerce companies use web activity databases for marketing purposes. You know, when you got to accept them cookies, and you agree to use the cookies to use the website, that all that, all your browsing through that website is guaranteeing going into a database somewhere so they can analyze the best way to route you to where to buy something and route you away from buy, uh, from asking for help. Yeah. Yeah, but how's the website going to keep you logged in if you don't have a cookie? Yeah, that's part of the web development course. There, that's not a two-minute conversation how that works. But yes, there's 
sometimes you need that so that you can also keep you logged in. It ties you to the database, the back end while you're talking to the site. Reporting and data mining database applications. They don't generate new data. They summarize what is there. Um, now, for those of us that are past a certain vintage and have been in Ottawa at least for, you know, a certain amount of years, probably remember a company called Cognos. Now, I just said Cognos and I had one person nod and everybody else is like, whatever. They got bought by IBM. They were like one of Ottawa's crowning jewels of technology way back, back in the Nortel days. That's going back a few years. And Cognos was a distributed reporting platform. Essentially, you install this stuff on a server. You would run reports at night, distribute the reports to the appropriate people the next day. So then people could look at their reports and feel good about, you know, oh yeah, we sold one extra thing yesterday. We had a good day. Well, it depends what that one extra thing is, right? If it's one extra pencil, that's a joke. If it's, you know, a $100,000 computer system, well, that's great. It depends on what you consider good stuff. And a lot of these BI systems are used for predicting future performance. So if you look at your trend last year compared to this year's trend, you can do some analysis to determine whether or not you're on a good trend, a bad trend compared to past years, that kind of thing. And I am not going to go through this slide line by line. Here's some examples with a little bit more detail. It's in the slide decks on Brightspace in week one. Um, so applications serve a slight purpose, the ones that talk to the database server. Um, they create and process forms. Brightspace, you log in, you type some stuff into a login form, you hit submit, it processes it. It tells you if you logged in or not. You click on my grades. It's running a query to see how you're doing and it gives it to you. Um, I get reports based on um, the content. So I can run a report for the stats of the results for tests, uh, the results of, um, you know, how how often are people late? There's all kinds of things, I, all kinds of metrics I can pull out of Brightspace. Um, it executes application logic. When you guys upload a file for submission, it needs to do stuff. So it uploads the file, it saves it somewhere, it puts a record in the database, it lets me know that you've uploaded the file, that I need to grade it. Then I grade it, it does something else. It basically, you know, it prepares it for me and then I go submit grades or publish grades, I mean, and suddenly everybody gets to find out how well or badly they did. That's application logic. And it controls the application itself based on various uh, pieces of information. Control happens. For example, students do not see the same thing I do. Because you guys see what belongs to you. I get to see everything for everybody in this room, in this class. I can see what you've submitted. I can see everybody's grades, et cetera, et cetera. But you can only see your own things. The application controls it. So I'm not a fan of, as always, I seem to not be a fan of a lot of these slides. Um, this slide's out of date, to be honest. So over here, we've got the different relational database systems. And that's a very small subset, by the way. And these percentages are very misleading. So Microsoft SQL Server, 60 to 90% of companies use it. Why is it 60 to 90%? If they use any Microsoft Server product, automatically they've got SQL Server installed. Done. Office 365, SQL Server is running in the background, so you're using it. Done. Outlook, same deal. Oracle, again, 40 to 80%. What does that mean? Like, it's like one number should double size the other. Basically, it means that Oracle's out there. One thing about Oracle, though, is over the last, I'm going to compare Oracle to COBOL. COBOL is a programming language that's been around forever. 
everybody predicts that this is the year COBOL dies. What a lot of people don't realize is four years ago, they released a new version of COBOL that supports object orientation. COBOL's going nowhere anytime soon. The computers that run COBOL, on the other hand, is a problem. But COBOL is around forever. Oracle, same thing. Oracle has certain things it does that it does well. But the thing, the funny thing about Oracle is their sales have been flat for the last 10 years. They are losing, they are retaining customers. They don't have growth. They, I mean, obviously they sell every year a little bit new ones, but by the same time, they're losing customers at the same rate as they're gaining. So they make money. They're going to be around forever. It's a good job to have as an Oracle administrator because it's always going to be needed. But it's Oracle. Uh, MySQL, 80% of companies use it. Yes, it's the foot fungus of the database world. Everybody uses it because the second you install any content management system, odds are it's running MySQL. WordPress, MySQL. Um, Joomla, MySQL. Pretty much anything that lets you put up a formatted set of pages on the internet is going to be running MySQL. MySQL is free. People use it. There are different flavors of MySQL, but they're all basically the same. IBM DB2, used by 15 to 30% of the world. IBM DB2 is a very niche product. It, it runs on midis and mainframes. It'll run on your computer just fine, but it is designed for big enterprise. Normally, you don't run it on a Linux server. You're going to run it on a Z series mainframe. So when you see 15 to 30%, that's not necessarily a shock. It's going to be the big companies that are running it. And then you got Postgres right at the end, 15%. And that one is also very misleading. Um, PostgreSQL is very prevalent. Um, it is 90% feature compatible with Oracle. The problem is that it was a slow starter out of the gate. Currently, modern versions of Postgres by far outstrip features for almost every other database server on a dollar for a dollar basis. Why do I say a dollar for dollar basis? Because Postgres is free. Um, it's a really good system. And I'm not saying that because that's what we use at my day job. I've been using Postgres for, you know, 17 years. It has grown a lot in the last 17 years. There's got non-relational, which there's MongoDB, Hadoop, Cassandra, React, and Couchbase. You can notice the percentages being really low because those are fairly new technology. And in the database world, when we say new technology, it's something that's appeared in the last 15 years. You gotta take into account, database servers have been around since the 60s. SQL showed up in the late 70s, early 80s. Nothing changed except giving you slight new features and stuff like that until about 15 years ago when the no SQL thing started picking up steam. And then a bunch of people looked at it and they realized that they were actually taking a step backwards and going back into the 60s with no SQL. It has its place. It does certain things really, really well, but it's very niche. You wouldn't want to run an e-commerce site on a NoSQL system. You might want to do the reporting on the NoSQL system, but not the actual transactions. And that's a sample of a form. And I, these some of these slides are pulled straight from the course resources for the textbook. That unfortunately is access. It makes me cry. Uh, there's talking about some SQL in here, and I'm literally going to skip over the SQL slides because you won't need to know until the, after the break. And that's a sample of a report. You got a class, you got a course, you got some people that are taking classes in their grades. Literally, when I bring up uh, Brightspace, I can go into the grade book and see how everybody's grades are. It's the same idea, it's a report. Um, now back to the database applications for control. 
It executes appropriate logic. It controls the application. Um, only allow it basically allows only specific things to be shown to the uh, users. It controls the activity for the database management system. Um, so the DBMS has certain functions: create database, create tables, create the supporting structures that go with it. Uh, it allows you to manipulate the data that's stored in the database. It allows you to read the data out of the database. It allows you to maintain the structures. Sometimes you need to add fields, change field, rename fields, that kind of thing. Just maintenance. Um, you can use it to enforce rules. Uh, you can basically say, you know, certain pieces of information must follow certain rules. Um, for example, you can't give somebody a negative age. Because, you know, that's not how that works. Or you could say that a, you know, you're not allowed to order a negative quantity of products, or you're not allowed to order zero products, and it'd still be considered a proper order. Um, it controls concurrency. That's actually one of the big ones. Concurrency means letting more than one person touch the data at the same time. Imagine when you're using Brightspace that every single time one of you clicks a button, everybody else has to wait. That is not cool. Um, there once was a time database servers were like that. Uh, that's why banks go offline week on weekends on the regular basis. Um, because they need to do certain tasks while nobody's touching the database. Uh, I don't know how many people here here with BMO, but you will notice that certain transactions, your balance on your account is the weekend, but certain transactions will not show up until Monday. Like you buy some stuff and you tap it all weekend and you'll just see that your total's going down, but you won't actually see the taps all the time in your your purchases and then suddenly Monday shows up and now you, you know you just realize you know, just how many times you tapped your phone on the way through. Um that's because banks control concurrency on the weekend so they can do some maintenance tasks. And then performing backups and recoveries, backing things up is important. Being able to recover the backup is more important um, because what's the point of having a backup if you can't recover from it? Okay, skip. I'm not gonna talk about access. Keep going. Access is basically a database that runs on your desktop. It's a single user database. It lets you create a database that only you get to use. So it's, you know, whatever. Um, enterprise class database systems. So enterprise class database systems are systems that allow access over multiple sources. Um, even with Brightspace, you know how you get at it through a web interface? But there's also a couple different apps you can install on your phones. There's one for the teachers, there's one for the students, and it gives us different views of said data. Uh, it probably has an API of some sort, so that you know that's a back end thing that you can't see. But uh, some other services could talk to Brightspace to get student information out of it back and forth. Um, a good example of that is Turnitin. I don't know if you've heard of Turnitin. Uh, it's an anti cheat tool that we have access to. We can basically mark applications as must be scanned by Turnitin. It takes your submissions, put it in to turn it in, turn it in, processes them, and then it updates the information in Brightspace by using a backend interface. So an enterprise system is basically a big chongus of a server running in the background with a bunch of other servers sitting in front of it. And all of these servers are talking to the database server in the background, each doing their own job. And the database management system is making sure that all these different services can talk to the database. My MySQL is not an enterprise class. MySQL is like one step above access. Enterprise class is IBM DB2, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, depending which version you bought. Um, Postgres can be enterprise class depending on how you decide to set it up. If you're going with a cloud provider like Amazon or Azure or 
Yeah, those are the two that actually do it right. So we'll stick with two. Um, I think Google might do it. I really don't know. I've never played with their tools. Um, then you can literally have enterprise class Postgres, technically enterprise class MySQL too, but it's not really MySQL anymore. It just means that it's it's more capable. It's not gonna fart and fall over. Now in MySQL 8, uh, there's a few pieces of interface. This slide really isn't that important for now, but this is a administrative tool, a screenshot of the administrative tool. And in here, you'll see that we have a list of databases down the side. For some unknown reason, in MySQL 8, they decided to call the schemas instead of databases. Uh, that's an or that's when Oracle bought out MySQL, they started renaming things because Oracle knows best. Uh, this is where you type your commands. This is the results come out. That's your go button. It's really not that complicated an interface. Uh, after the break, you'll see me playing in this a lot. So you'll get really familiar with it really fast. So now we're going to start talking about database design. And I think I'm almost done with week one. Oh, damn, I'm on schedule. So there's three types of database design. There's designing from existing data. So you'd analyze the spreadsheets and other sources of data they provide from you. You might pull data out of other database systems. You'd use something called the normalization principles to do the design because you might be inheriting a really gross spaghetti mess of data that you got to clean up. There once was a time where this also involved getting pieces of paper from a company to figure out what they did. You don't see that as much anymore. Uh, any company of any size today that's still doing things with paper and only paper is, you know, probably not going to be around for very long. So essentially, you will get old systems, bring them forward into a modern system while re implementing certain things. For example, the school is currently exploring a new student information system. You guys know it as Access. It's, we also have a piece called Genesis. The two put together does all the scheduling. Stuff. The school is realizing that they might need to retire these old computers that this is running on, and they're looking at something more modern. But the problem is that they have all the old data. They got to map it to the new system. There's probably going to be need, you know, whatever company they're working with um, is probably working with them to make the old data fit into the new system and maybe create new objects handle all these odds and ends. There's new systems development where you create a data model from requirements and then you take the data model and transform it into a database design. New system development is really fun. Um, it basically means you're coming into a clean room and you get to let your imagination go wild. When you're first coming out of school and you're th that gets thrown into your face, it's really daunting. I speak from experience on that one. Uh, first job right out of college was um, a little bit of A and a little bit of B. They had an old system I had to replace, but I wasn't allowed to look at it because there was rules and contracts involved. So I, they told me, this is what the data looks like. This is what it's got to come out, and you figure it out. Okay, I got one hand here, and I don't know if that was a hand over there. It could be a data migration, it could be a data uh, upgrade, it could be a re-implementation. So for example, like I was saying about my first job right out of school, I had to design a database, not knowing what the original database looked like. I only knew what kind of data it contained, not how it was organized and how any of it worked with each other. It was a little uh, special. It was a big learning experience real fast. Um, Sometimes the new system development is you're the CEO of the company went off on vacation for three weeks, comes back with a brand new idea for a new product and everybody cries because he went on a, what we, the company I work for now, way back in the day, had a president that used to go on vision quests. We used to joke about how he went on a vision quest and he'd go away on vacation for a month to some remote location somewhere around the world, spend two weeks disconnected from the universe. 
and come back with all kinds of new ideas, 90% of which were impossible to implement. I can't even describe what his ideas were like. Like some of it was like, let's make, that's like, I don't know if you remember the old Staples ad with the big red easy button. What do you come in and say, you know, this, this functionality in the desktop software, we want to make it easier. Just put a button that makes that happen. Dude, there's like 26 steps that the user has to do. You can't make a button. It'd be like you launched a Photoshop because the software, the company I work for, we write the desktop uh, design design software. I'm one of the web developers. I don't do the desktop stuff, but you know, basically they compete with Corel Draw and Adobe Illustrator. But it's a niche market. And he wanted to create a button that allowed you to record all the actions you did and then replay them, but you could tell it to skip certain steps. So suddenly you skip the step where you add a layer to design. You know, weird stuff like that. So that's a vision quest. When he, when he came in and had database ideas, I wanted to cry. Uh, they were usually not very easy to implement. But by the same token, a new system development can be fun because you're not limited by what is there now. You have what they want you to do, and you can run with that. Uh, and then there's a database redesign, which is you've got the old system. They want to add new features, so you're going to redesign, take the old design, make some changes, improve it, do some data migration, fix it up a little bit, and move on. Uh, that is the least glamorous one of the bunch. It's boring. It's time consuming because you got to make sure you break nothing, you lose nothing. And then you got the structured design lifecycle. Um, and the best part is, is we've got two slides with the exact same thing. So I'm going to go with the second slide. Um, this is the waterfall view. And this is just the cycle, but they actually all have the same steps. Um, you assess the needs. You decide, decide whether or not the ideas are feasible. Um, you know, you come up with a couple of alternate plans. Sometimes it's designing some UI, so you get your UI people to come up with different ideas, and then you pass you pass some users. Uh, you look at the different options, choose one, do some more design, develop and test. If that's good, then you implement it. If that's good, you evaluate it. Then you go back to assessing your needs over and over and over again. Um, this falls into the whole category of uh, Oh man, what's the word I'm looking for? Like you'll hear about agile development. You'll hear about waterfall development, some hybrids between the two. They're all the same thing. It's just the size of the bytes are different. Even with agile, you assess a need, you decide if it can be done, you figure out how to do it, you make it happen, you get it tested, and you go back to the first one. Oh, you're agile because the job that only took three hours instead of three weeks. You're doing it in smaller chunks. The only difference between waterfall and agile, realistically, is a bunch of different buzzwords and how much time you spend on any given task. So I will be giving you guys some pages to read. Um, I finally got my textbook yesterday. Hey, okay. So I got my textbook yesterday. So I really haven't, I've had the 15th edition of the textbook, not the 16th edition. Page numbers are different. As far as I can tell, that's the only difference is the page number is different. And uh, uh, there's actually a couple less typos. So I will be giving you guys page numbers to read. Probably by the end of this week, I will start posting page numbers for you guys to read. They're just good to have. Uh, there are hybrid tasks that you should be doing. Um, specifically, when I send out the Here's what you're supposed to be working on announcement. I will include, this is the hybrids you should be reading. This is the hybrid test you should be doing. I don't like making my students guess. Everything you're supposed to do will show up in writing in the announcements. Um, and make sure your due dates and blah, 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 because otherwise you lose marks. You give me nothing to grade. I give, it's the easiest grade on earth for me to give. 
What is the easiest grade to give? There we go. Yes, zero is easy to give because I don't have to think about it. There is no judgment on that. All right, I'm now going to go into this week's lecture. And I'm only going to go for half an hour because there was a lot of information that I went through pretty quick and I don't want to melt everybody's brains. Um, and if you're curious how many times I've taught this course, <laughs> uh, week two. No, not that button. Okay. So I'm going to start, so I'm hoping that I can get through about a third of lecture two. We'll pick it up next week. And by the end of next week, we'll almost be caught up to where we're supposed to be. And then the pace will slow down a little bit. Um, I will try to have the recording because, you know, some of you have noticed the nice little webcam I've got going on here. Um, I'll try to have the recording up tonight. If not, it'll be up tomorrow at some point. So. And so far, Camtasia has not crashed because I've got a light on the front that shows me Camtasia is running. It doesn't like my webcam. It doesn't like a 2K webcam. Go figure. All right. So week two is where we are actually defining uh, uh, tables and relationships, uh, different kinds of keys, what entities and entity relationships are, and learn how to determine entities, attributes, and relationships. So, the first point I don't need to talk about, because I literally talked about this, uh, but essentially a database system is organized in tables with rows. Rows are also known as records or tuples, uh, depending on which level of edu education you're at. A row and a record are the same thing. A tuple is not quite the same thing, but often referred to it the same way. Um, Tuples tend to show up in third year university, fourth year university. It has a different uh, connotations than a row of data. There's more to it than just a row of, of data. And there's columns and those are called attributes or fields. Uh, so sometimes you'll hear me use the word row. Sometimes you'll hear me use the word record. You'll almost never hear me use the word tuple. And you'll hear me use the word column. And you might hear me use the word field because those two are the same thing. An attribute is a field, but a different stage in the design process. So database design is strange. When you're working at the nascent level of the, as in it's a baby database, and you haven't actually formalized the structure yet, it has certain words. And when you start formalizing, it becomes other words. So depending on what stage you're at, you're gonna be using the words that mean very similar things, but they're used differently in different places. Um, I always have a hard time finding real world examples of that. Um, computer science is a weird thing. Um, so columns represent categories of data. So in other words, you have an, a, a row or a record. It's a collection of columns. Each of those columns have different things in it. First name, last name, date of birth, Street address, street address too, city, province, postal code, country of origin, you know, phone number, if you have a phone, email, a personal email address, gender, amongst other pieces of information that might be considered a row. Each of those would be columns, a collection of each of those columns for one person is a row, also known as an instance. So remember, half an hour ago, I talked about how each of you are an instance of a student. Each of your pieces of personal information, each of those unique pieces, your first name, middle name, last name, those are columns, but all the columns that belong to you together, and that's a row. And databases are structured methods to store data. Right, it really feels weird covering some of these slides right after finishing the previous slideshow. Um, so naming convention in this course, I use a slightly different naming convention from the other profs, and it's slightly different than what you see in the textbook. So you will notice that this slide in particular will be different in this course section than in every other course section. But I will also make an aside. 
in a moment to explain to you guys things about naming conventions. Table names are going to be lowercase. So let me make this even simpler. Everything is lowercase. I do not want to see camel case. This is not Java. Everything is lowercase. And how do you separate words? You use underscores. Do not use spaces. Do not use dashes. Use an underscore. As you can see right here, section number has an underscore to separate the two words. Thus, this is readable. This particular naming convention, just so you know, is known as snake case. It's long and skinny. Whereas for Java, it's known as camel case because the upper case letters make humps. This is also, if ever you learn Python, that's the naming convention they use in Python. Strangely enough, snake case is for Python. Um, it's kind of cute because snake case existed before Python did. But anyways, so this is where I'm going to say one big statement about naming conventions. Regardless of what naming conventions you learn, when you get your first job, you're going to learn new naming conventions. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, because I got to upload the updated slide. So if you guys are following along with the slides on Brightspace, I finished updating this last night, then I crashed. I forgot to upload it. I have a full-time job. I realized on my, as I was walking into class today that I forgot to upload it. And then I wanted to, you know, two minutes to decompress before I started lecture. As you can see in Brightspace, you will see the slide based on what the other profs say, which is uppercase table name, mixed case field names, blah, 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 blah. By tonight, that slide will be changed on Brightspace. So. Which leads me back to the whole thing of, depending on where you work, you're going to have different naming conventions. Therefore, this is a good time in your career to learn to accept that there is more than one way to write something. When I, at my job, it's snake case. Previous job I had at, we used camel case. If you're operating on Oracle, it's uppercase, also known as screaming case. There is different naming conventions in different places. When you see tests, there might be a mix mash of naming conventions in the test. One of the goals for this course is for you to be flexible enough to recognize what it is you're looking at. And not just based on how it is in Java, which you guys probably haven't learned anything about yet. But there's, depending on which, whether the first letter is uppercase or not, it means something different in Java. It's the program will work regardless of how you write it, but sometimes one means a variable, another one means a class or a function, depending on what the first letter is doing. It helps you identify things. And this slide deck, yes, pretty much. There's been a few typos fixed, uh, but yeah. All right, so. Not all tables are relations. So the term table and relation are used interchangeably. Again, this leads back to the old versus the new. Not the old versus the new, the stage in the design process. When you're first designing, it's probably gonna be called a relation, an attribute, and a tuple. In the database, once it's, we're talking about the physical design of the database where we're, you know, getting to the end stage of the design process, then it's a table, a column, and a row. And if we are really going back years ago, file, field, and record. That's why you often see record and row replaced because this last one has to do with what's called a 4GL, COBOL. Progress, um, some other database systems where they don't use SQL and they're not relational. They actually have files on disk and each file has fields. Each collection of fields is a record. And over the years, the word file has been dropped. Table and relation still stick around. Attribute and tuple still stick around, but column and field are interchangeable. 
row and record interchangeable. So this is a good one to refer to when you hear me talking in the class and I go, it's a table. It's a row. A row and a record is the same thing. A column and a field is the same thing. The blue row is basically the same thing, just at a different stage. And this is examples from the textbook. You can see they're using uppercase with camel case mixed in. So this is a good example of, you know, seeing a different set of naming conventions in use. You can see that the table names here and here are in uppercase. The field or column names are camel case. When they created these, this database as examples for the textbook, they used that naming convention. Different database servers treat things differently, which is why naming conventions can be important. Um, MySQL doesn't care, it's case insensitive. I could write lowercase student, uppercase student, it thinks it's the same thing. My, Microsoft SQL Server depends what language the server is installed as. Is it installed in English? Then it's case sensitive. Is it installed in, in some other language? Then it's case insensitive. Oracle lies because it stores two versions of everything. It stores the table name in the way you wrote it originally plus the uppercase. So it's, that's how it becomes case insensitive. It does the same thing with the field names. And Postgres is the other way around where it's anal retentive about case sensitivity. Thus, naming conventions are important. Often they're dictated by the platform you're working on. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I'm going to update the slide and I'll put, with the assignments, I'll put reminders on the assignments. As long, what I care about more, so before we move off the topic of the naming conventions, is consistency. I don't want what you guys submit to me to look like it went through a blender. Is it one part Java, one part database, one part, I don't know, I feel cute today, so I'm going to write it this way. If you submit something and it's consistent throughout, you'll get your points. I'm not going to write you on it. Why? Because the textbook tells you to do it one way. I tell you to do it another way. The slide decks are a mixed match. So there's going to be some confusion. Uh, I'm sure the Discord, if it hasn't appeared yet, will appear soon enough. And some people are going, oh, I'm doing a lab too, and I don't have any ideas. Like, Can anybody Discord give me a hand? And then they, somebody hands them their version of the assignment. And then I'll know if their submission comes from another section because it's going to follow somebody else's naming conventions. As long as you're consistent, I'll be happy. Okay. So, just keeping an eye, keeping an eye on the time. So, relational database products store data about entities and relationships. And a relation is a special type of table. A relation is a two-dimensional table that has the following characteristics. It has rows that contain data about an entity. So, you're an entity instance. It contains data about that. Columns contain data attributes of the entities. All entries in a column are of the same kind. So if we have a column that is called date of birth, you're not going to store somebody's name in it. Therefore, each column contains the same kind of data. If there's a column called first name or given name, that's going to have people's given name. If you have a column called family name or surname, it will have people's surnames in it. Different countries have different rules on this. <laughs> so, you know, there's certain different quirks depending on where you're from and what is considered good data. Yes. <laughs> well, for example, in some countries, um, like in North America, Database systems that track people require a surname, a family name. If you're from India, for example, some people don't have last names. That's why I often get students where they have, you know, their name is, uh, oh man, I've seen some interesting names over the years. <coughs> and there's some other, uh, some African countries do it too, where I've literally had students come in there and say their name is Hassan Hassan. 
Not because their last name is Sasan, is they don't have a last name, so they just put their first name in as their last name. <coughs> Excuse me. So different countries will have different rules on the data. In North America, we make last names required. In other parts of the world, last name is not required because people, some people will not have them, even inside the same family. Some people have a first name and a last name. Some people don't. It's a cultural decision on how that works. And at different parts of the world, follow slightly different rules. Um, each column will have a unique name. You can't have two columns called date of birth. Why? Because the database server will not know what you're talking about. Each cell of a table, also known as a column. So in the column, when you're talking about a row of information, each of those intersection of column and a row can only ever contain one value. Again, date of birth is a good example. Can anybody have more than one date of birth? Pretty sure we all popped out once and only once. Therefore, we have a single date of birth. Some people are unlucky, February 29th, or lucky, depending on how you want to define it. And often, they end up having to put in February 28th or March 1st as their date of birth for some systems. Why? Because some older systems just refuse to acknowledge the fact that there's years. But a date of birth can only ever contain one date of birth for one person. Thus, each cell can contain one and only one value. The order of the columns is unimportant. You could have first name, date of birth, last name, address, phone number, city. Who cares? As long as all the columns are there, great. What's important is whether or not you can refer to each of those columns individually. The order of the rows is not important. For example, students register in the system. They basically go in one after another. That's why your student numbers are sequential. And one of these years, the student numbers aren't going to start with 040. They're going to start with 041. Once we get enough students to actually cause that first, that last zero to roll over, we're getting close. <coughs> But the order of the row is not important because the database server will retrieve the rows and sort them if you as needed. So it's not important. And no two rows may be identical. <coughs> Holy cow, just a second guys. <coughs> I haven't had project in a couple of weeks. My throat's not happy with me projecting. Um, <coughs> no two rows may be identical. Okay, two kids are born. They're identical twins. Genetically, they might be pretty much identical. As far as the government is concerned, they're not identical because they're going to have two different names. The problem is if you cannot have two identical rows is that the database server will not which to give you. So each row must be unique unto itself. Whether it's because it uses a different piece of information to make uniqueness happen, such as a SIN number, or in this case, a student number. And a bit of an old story from the college. Once upon a time, they used the SIN number as the unique identifier for students. They were still given a student number, because at least they had that much brain to not use your SIN number as your student number. But when they started opening the doors to international students, and they were using things like student visa and passport, like visa, like student visas or passport numbers. They started having conflicts where it just so happened that some people's visa numbers matched up to the same as somebody's SIN number. The system suddenly goes, dude, I don't know who you're talking about. You're talking about Frank? You're talking about Mohammed? I don't know. They got the same number. Then the system shit the bed promptly. They actually had to come up, they had to start making up SIN numbers for these students coming in just so they could get them into the system. They patched it. This was, you know, 1970s, early 80s. It's been fixed for a long, long time. But it's one of those short-sightedness things where 
we suddenly had rows started being identical because Murphy's Law would state. You've got two matching numbers, two matching names, and the whole thing just went no. And there's some examples in here of, you know, a relation of an employee table where you've got an employee number, first name, last name, their department, some email address, and their phone number. This just so these are columns, also known as fields. The columns have names. This collection of columns contain combined is a row. Each of these is the cell. So it's the intersection of a row and a column. So each of these is unique. So basically what I was just talking about for a few minutes, that's what it looks like to a human. The computer sees it completely different, but that's what it looks like to a human. <laughs> this is a relation. Relation is made up of columns or fields that have unique names. Each collection of columns is a row and each intersection of a column and a row is a value. There's no questions before I keep moving on. Okay, so this is an example of a non-relational table. And this is a terrible thing to work with. Now, what's the difference between this one and the one before? You will see that there's multiple entries per row for a given column. So this is what they call non-normalized data. It's a non-relational database. Stuff you would see in a NoSQL system, like a like a Mongo or you know one of those guys, where each row can define its structure, and you have to write code in such a way that it doesn't care what the structure of the data is. You just kind of wing it. This is really hard to work with because essentially these numbers are tied to this row, but currently there's three separate entries on the same row. So when you see this, it's not a relation anymore. It's just a table of information. It's Excel. Problem is a modern database system does not allow more than one value per column. So you'd have to store that as something else, not just a phone number. <laughs> Easiest way to do the example is, can I sit in that chair right now while you're in it? This is basically saying we can have three people occupying that space at the same time. It's no longer organized, it's no longer structured, it's no longer identifiable, it's just noise. It's Excel. Uh, no, that would be acceptable because that would still be a value. The absence of value is still a value. So not everybody would have a fax. Not everybody might have their home phone number in the system. But if there's only one entry for each of those, they can be populated individually and suddenly it's back to being a relation. Because we're not trying to jam three things into the same space. That's just it. So this is where the whole NoSQL thing comes in, where the phone number is actually what they call a leaf and has multiple leaves of information in that row. So it has a row, and inside that row, there's sub rows. It's really hard to work with, which is why it's really good for reporting purposes, but pretty much useless for actual transactional day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, for example, you will never see something like this in a banking system. Why? Because it's easy to break. So our goal is to have stuff that looks like this, not like this. <laughs> so, which leads me to keys. It's actually a good spot to stop after this. Keys. <laughs> a combination of one or more columns that is used to identify a particularly particular row in a relation. So, in the school system, so in Axis, 
Your keys is your student number. Each of you have a unique student number. You can't use a person's name. You can't use a person's phone number. You can't use a person's email address. Why, for example, can't you use a person's name or their phone number? This is an easy one, guys. Just think about it for 10 seconds. That's one issue. Multiple people with the same name. Phone number could have the same problem. What happened if you've got two students that live at the same house? Right? My daughter comes to Algonquin. Her boyfriend comes to Algonquin. They live in my basement. Technically, they have the same home phone number. Can't use that. But there's another problem with things like names. Anybody want to take a guess? So the, by the lack of, re oh, let's see. You had your hand and you stopped and you went. Yes, sir. People, their names are malleable. Names mean nothing. You give the government 250 bucks and you can change your name. <laughs> so that much, how much it costs to change your name. It's 250 bucks, or it was last time I saw it. Names change. You can't use it as a guarantee. Phone numbers change. Email addresses change. Heck, man, can't even use a SIN number anymore. I know at least three people who've had to change their SIN numbers in the last 20 years. Why? Identity theft. Somebody got a hold of their SIN number. Opened up a bunch of accounts in their name. Became someone else. Ruined their credit. Well, now they got to reboot their life. Time for a new SIN number. It happens. Yes. No, you're not responsible for debts created by someone else, but you have to prove you didn't do it. <laughs> Proving it to a bank that you didn't take that money is really, really hard. Um, I mean, I had a case where uh, there's someone in New Brunswick, exact same name as me, and their sick is only off from me by two digits. I applied for credit once, and they told me I lived in New Brunswick. I go, no. Let's go check what you punched in and the person that inverted two digits. So, you know, it's not that hard. So a key is a way to uniquely identify a row of data. A key could be a composite key. It's made up of multiple pieces of information at the same time. That method is slowly, or I should say quickly, dying of death uh, because it's hard to work with comp composite keys. Um, a candidate key is a key that has not become a primary key yet. So when you're doing the initial design, and we'll be talking about candidate keys later in the term, when you're doing a database design, you are going through certain steps called normalization. While you're normalizing the data, you're trying to identify which pieces of information you can use as unique identifiers. Any of those that come up as a potential identifier is known as a candidate key. Again, one of the popular ones is a SIN number. It is used in a lot of places. Banks. Uh, Revenue Canada. The biggest user of SIN numbers in Canada. Um, healthcare system. You know, sometimes need your SIN number so they can issue you a card. Prove at least you're a Canadian citizen. That kind of thing. Um, that's a candidate key. It's probably not going to become the primary key, but it's a candidate key. A primary key is basically once you've identified, okay, this is the unique that we're going to use, the candidate key gets elected to become a primary key. So candidate means these ones look pretty good. I think we might go with these. Primary key says, yeah, that's the one. A primary key allows you to uniquely identify a piece of data in the database. Here at the school, since that's something you guys all grasp, your student number is your primary key. In Access, your student number is how they find you. 
Often, if, I don't know how many of you have gone to the registrar's office in the last couple of weeks, but often they will ask you one of the couple of questions. What's your phone number? Or what's your student number? Guaranteed, they really prefer the student number over the phone number. It's not often you have multiple students at the same phone number, but it happens. But your student number uniquely identifies you to the school. Even if you leave school for five, six years and come back, you will still have the same student number. It follows you for your entire college career at Algonquin. For schools, different student numbers. If you used to go to Carleton, you'll have a Carleton student number. It's not the same student number as Algonquin's. Yeah, pretty much. So that system, often email will become a primary key systems. Why? You don't want the same email address to register multiple times, so you can force a rule saying this one must be unique in the system. But what's fun with that one is, you know, you can create a second college student's account with a different email address. Um, I think they finally fixed that now that it uses your uh, Ontario student number. Uh, but if you're not from Ontario, I really don't know what it uses. So, you know, when I applied for college, we did it on paper and it got mailed. <laughs> so I'm a little bit before the college, Ontario colleges thing. Um, every relation, there's only one primary key. In other words, for every table of data, there's only one unique identifier for that table. That doesn't mean there's a unique identifier for only one row. It means that everything in that table shares the same kind of unique identifier. And there is only one. You can't have two unique identifiers because then they're not unique identifiers anymore. There's potential lookup items, but they're not unique identifiers. And the primary key may be a single key or a composite key. It means that student number is a single key. It's a single value that identifies you. Other systems may use something different. SIN number plus email. You know, a combination of two things may identify it. Um, yeah, I really have a hard time coming up with the composite examples because I'm not, I don't tend to use them, so. Okay, so here's some examples really quick. Student number one, two, three, four. So you got a student table. Um, you got a class table with, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40. When we look at the grades table, there's a bunch of GPAs in it, but we don't know who they belong to because there's no primary keys. There's nothing, no way to identify anything. <laughs> so the primary key uniquely identifies this row of data. That means that the value one only ever shows up once in student number. Two, three, four only ever show up the one time. Same thing with the class number 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Each of those will only ever show up one time. It's unique. It can never be added a second time. Even if it's deleted, it, most systems won't let you allow you to re-add it. Once it's been given out, it, and you can never re-give it out. Yep. Now the, the key here is the class number 10, 20, 30, 40. In theory, right now you got Chem 101, Chem 101, 10 and 20, because this is like section number. Picture is the section number, right? Where we have six sections of 8215. Section 300, 310, 320, 330, 340, 350. And for the first time since I've been teaching this, and I've been teaching this for 15 years, the 360. Even though they're all CST 8215, it identifies different groups of students. Same idea with the class number. A surrogate key, which is identified here, is a primary key field that is automatically assigned by the computer. Um, I will spend some more time on surrogate keys probably next week. Yeah, definitely. Um, but essentially, it's a number that's given to you by the computer. Has no real world meaning. Other than it belongs to that system. Your student number has no real world meaning. It really doesn't when you think about it. It's just a number that's been given to you. Yay, you're 04012345678. Congratulations. The next one is, you know, 68, 69, 70. 
the numbers have no real world meaning outside the fact that it's a number assigned to you. Okay. I'm going to kill it here. So we are on slide 14 of 48 for this one. Good times. I will update this slide deck into Brightspace. The recording should be up sometime tonight or tomorrow. Um, and I will be releasing Lab 2 momentarily. And I'll send out an announcement later about everything you guys have to address. Okay? Have fun, guys. I will see you in Lab.